Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For our in-house guests, we do ask that last courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. And of course, for those watching online now and in the future, you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Leading our program and welcoming our guest is Ted Broman, Senior Research Fellow in Anglo-American Relations in our Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. Dr. Broman focuses on Anglo-American relations, U.S. and British relations with Europe and the European Union, the United States' leadership role in the world, as well as international organizations and treaties. He joined us in 2008 after serving nine years as Yale University's Associate Director of International Security Studies. He regularly provides commentary on several major U.S. and international media outlets, he also serves as a columnist for Newsday, Forbes, and Great Britain's Yorkshire Post. He is also an adjunct professor of strategic studies in, strategic, in the strategic studies program at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. Please join me in welcoming Ted Broman. Ted? Thanks, thanks very much, John. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be able to welcome Professor John Lewis Gaddis here to the Heritage Foundation. Professor Gaddis is the Robert A. Lovett Professor of Military and Naval History at Yale. He's the author before this current volume of 10 previous books. Uh, he started off rather fast. His first book, The U.S. and the Origins of the Cold War, won the Bancroft Prize, history's highest honor, in 1973. His most recent book before the current volume, George F. Kennan and American Life, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2012. In between those two volumes, he's published a series of field-defining books, Strategies of Containment, We Now Know, a wonderfully titled work on the new history of the Cold War, Surprise, Security and the American Experience, and The Cold War, A New History. He was awarded the National Humanities Medal by President George W. Bush in 2005, and he was and remains one of the most popular professors and one of the best teachers at Yale University. Most relevant to, for our discussion today, perhaps, he is the founding director of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy at Yale, which I regard as being responsible for the revival of the study in the American Academy and the policy world of Grand Strategy. Let's hope that the government starts taking some cues from Grand Strategy as well. And last, but for me not least, he's also my former boss. So it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome Professor Gaddis here. The way we're going to run the discussion today is I'll start off for about 30 or 40 minutes uh, with a discussion with Professor Gaddis, question and answer. And then for the remainder of our time, uh, we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, there will be a microphone or maybe several microphones that go around then. Uh, and uh, we'll conclude after about an hour and 15 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, after the talk today, Professor Gaddis will be signing copies of On Grand Strategy, which are available for sale in the lobby, 20 bucks a copy. Uh, so if you haven't purchased your copy, go get one, come up to the front, and uh, I'm sure he'll be happy to sign it for you. So uh, let's get started uh, with uh, sort of an initial question here. And I'm sure you're going to see this coming, but just for the sake of the audience, um, Everyone here is familiar with foreign policy, security studies, strategic studies. Uh, there are lots of areas of commentary and academic study that seem like grand strategy. How is grand strategy different from all of these other areas of study and practice? Okay, I'll try to take a whack at that one, Ted. Um, first of all, thank you all for uh, being here. Thanks to Heritage for uh, sponsoring this. Uh, I think grand strategy is in a somewhat different category from most of the other academic fields um, that are associated with the university. It seems to me grand strategy really most fundamentally deals with a tragic uh, human dilemma. And the dilemma is universal. It is irrevocably uh, unfixable. It is this, that aspirations can be anything that you want them to be, just dreams, um, unlimited, <coughs> infinite. Capabilities can never be that. 
And so that is the tragic fact of life that I think makes grand strategies uh, necessary because grand strategies are the way that you navigate that asymmetry. Now, <clears throat> grand strategy is not uh, deciding where to go in New Haven to get a pizza. That's petite strategy, uh, it seems to me. But grand strategy, I think, uh, Ted, really should be anything that is important to you, to the individual. So a young person might start out saying grand strategy involves um, what am I going to take in school? Um, what am I going to major in? Um, uh, what do I do after I graduate? Who am I going to fall in love with or out of with and so on? All of these are big questions, urgent questions uh, for young people. And then as they rise in prominence, the questions get larger. How do I navigate this particular job? How do I deal with this particular boss? And then at some point, uh, that person, the young person, becomes the boss. Uh, how do you navigate subordinates and deal with them? How do you deal with the great issues of our time, of life and death in some cases? I think there is an ascending, uh, widening scope of responsibility. But it seems to me that strategies are grand at each of these levels in scale and should be thought of uh, in that way. That's why I think scale is just as important in thinking about grand strategy as time and space are in the more traditional uh, categories. So I have an unusually capacious definition of grand strategy that I think would not satisfy the purists uh, in, in this field. Uh, but it satisfies me, and I think it works with the students as well because uh, I'm really trying to make the point <clears throat> that we ought to be educating students across all of these, uh, all of these levels in one form or another. And uh, to some extent, I was telling Ted uh, today, he was asking to whom this book is addressed. And I, I think it is addressed to students. Uh, now, maybe other people may find it relevant, uh, and you're already in some indications some people have. But I think what I was trying to do is to say, and if I could have the ultimate seminar which would have the ultimate students in it, that is really good students. Uh, and I had ultimate, uh, I had plenty of time to deal with what I needed to deal with. Uh, unlimited uh, space, all of this. Uh, not money, I don't need money for this, just uh, time and space. Something like this is what, is how I would try to run a seminar. Something like this is what I would say to these young people. And if that's a value to older people, in more uh, lofty positions of responsibility, so much the better, of course. But I think my target here was uh, younger people, and as I was telling Ted, I think this is a book about teaching, uh, uh, which, uh, if it has wider applicability, maybe a kind of accidental applicability, but maybe that's how teaching works in the first place. So grand strategy is about limited means, but you wanted almost unlimited means to get the concept across. Well, something that? like that, yeah. Um, let me put it this way. The, part of the luxury of writing a book is that you can decide how long the book um, should be. You don't have to worry about uh, how long the class period is or uh, so on. Uh, but uh, clearly, I did not want to write another one that was as long as the last one was. Uh, so that's <laughs> one good standard to follow. A, a reader might approach a book on grand strategy expecting it to tell you how to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't seem to be a book about how to make a decision. It's a book about, at least as I read it, a book about how to acquire the ability to make the decision, make the right decision. Um, you have to start somewhere. Yeah, you do. well, it's, it's learning how to learn, uh, as I, yeah. some, some interpreters of Clausewitz have, have yeah. put it. Yeah. Um, or maybe you could say it's about the philosophy of strategic, strategic decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, what does temperament contribute to being able to navigate these successive levels of grand strategy in a successful kind of way? Well, <clears throat> temperament wound up being a big um, element of this book, somewhat to my surprise. I did not set out to write a book about temperament. There's a lot in there about it. Uh, I think what I did set out to write about <clears throat> was um, a quote from Scott Fitzgerald that has always haunted me. Uh, because my colleague, Professor Charlie Hill, loves to use this cryptic quote in seminar without explaining it to anybody. He just <laughs> uh, the quote is this, 
The sign of a, this is Fitzgerald, the sign of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold contradictory ideas in the mind at the same time while retaining the ability to function. And Charlie will pronounce this in a pontifical way and, and maintain a Buddha-like silence. <laughs> and the students say, what did he mean by that? And then they say, what did Fitzgerald mean by that? You know, and so on. So it really opens up all kinds of questions. And for me, it opened up the question of uh, temperament. I think that that question, the Fitzgerald question, is one of the big ones that runs through this book because one of the most fundamental contradictions in life is the one I mentioned, the difference between uh, aspirations and capabilities. So how do you deal uh, with these? Uh, obviously, uh, you can't make the dilemma go away. So we must live with that uh, contradiction. But how comfortable are you in actually tolerating opposing ideas going beyond this irrevocable one to others that certainly concern us in the, in the policy world? How, do you, how comfortable are you with the contradiction between freedom and uh, tyranny, for example, uh, in the world? How uh, 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 comfortable are you with the contradiction between profligacy and uh, um, economy in um, economic issues, and so on. There's a whole series of things out there that present contradictions that we have to deal with uh, in the real world. How comfortable are you with the idea that there might be some contradictions that can never be reconciled? And I think this one of aspirations and capabilities at the very top is one, but I think coming down the scale, there are a lot of uh, others. And this is one of um, Isaiah Berlin's major points, which he drew from Machiavelli. There are some things in life that we simply cannot resolve, and we must learn to live with the contradictions. Uh, and this is a direct takeoff from the astounding line in Machiavelli's Prince, which marked a turning point in Western civilization. When Machiavelli says, God does not wish to do everything. He leaves some things to us. And that is a magic moment, it seems to me. It really presents us with the question of what we can do, what we can't do, and how we live with that contradiction. Temperament is a big part of that. Berlin would say that the most dangerous thing is to try to reconcile all contradictions because he says that is what he calls positive liberty. He doesn't mean that as a compliment. That is uh, authoritarianism or even totalitarianism. The state does that for you. The state tells you how to do it. The state tells you how to manage your life in all respects. And the contradictions are wiped out. Often people are wiped out along the way in the process of wiping out the contradictions, as you know. But the preferable condition, Berlin has uh, argued, is negative liberty, by which he means uh, reserving the right uh, to yourself to decide how you want to live with uh, these contradictions. And that poses a huge dilemma, it seems to me, for us, because there are some people who are driven up the wall with living with contradictions. They simply are not comfortable uh, with this. They feel the urge to try to reconcile uh, them in one way or another. Classically and historically, I think a, a really excellent example is King Philip II of Spain, uh, who was operating in a deeply religious context and felt that uh, everything that happened uh, was uh, dictated by the will of God. And whatever contradictions might exist in the world meant that somehow we had failed God. Or late in life, uh, Philip came to the company that God had failed him. <laughs> God had failed Philip uh, with the defeat of the Armada. But what kind of a mentality is that, as opposed to a different kind of mentality, the kind of mentality you would have found in the great queen, Elizabeth, simply saying there are, uh, uh, life is complex, there are many things uh, that are contradictory in life, and uh, so we uh, live with them. Uh, terror, uh, terror versus uh, uh, eliciting um, uh, love in the population. She was both. She was uh, a, a Tyra, and she was deeply loved as well. Uh, the contradiction uh, between uh, uh, certainly uh, being 
female and being a leader, huge contradiction in those days, contradiction between uh, uh, virginity and uh, politics. Uh, she was there. Contradiction between art and statecraft. She was there too, and all of these things. You know. And ultimately, it occurred to me the reason she could tolerate this was that Elizabeth had what Milan Kandera called lightness of being. In the sense, she could laugh at herself, she could laugh at her courtiers, she could laugh at uh, the Armada, uh, she could even, if necessary, laugh at God and bring him under control and turn him into a good, staunch English nationalist. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Philip had none of this, he was totally humorous. Uh, and uh, so I think there's something very key about this in that regard. I became uh, really preoccupied with the notion to which this lightness of being, this uh, ability to laugh at yourself uh, and at, at others, may be part of the key to the toleration of contradictions, to the living uh, with them. And this is why I think I wound up being uh, very impressed with a diverse range of other characters who I think had this quality, one being uh, Octavian Augustus in uh, ancient Rome, one uh, certainly being Lincoln brilliantly, uh, one surely being uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, as well, all of whom were regarded uh, as lightweights by their enemies, uh, even by their patrons. So he surprised everybody by letting lightness of weight or lightness of being be a much heavier and more portentous concept than most people would have thought of. Long answer to that, I'm afraid. But some questions. You, you may be able to see why he's such a good lecturer uh, and, and good seminar leader, too, for that matter. Uh, as I was saying to you over lunch, I think it, in this book you practice a lot of what you preach. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinarily even-tempered book. Um, you know, it's not an angry book. There, there are clearly people who come off poorly, but it, it really, it's a wonderful read in that respect. Uh, but you do I got out of the business of doing Cold War history. That's why I'm no longer angry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think once you publish ten or so books on it, you could probably move on. Um, but you you do have some slightly harsh words uh, for Philip II, uh, as you mentioned, Stalin, uh, Xerxes. Uh, there are, are a number of other. Maybe there's some, not. There's some heavies in the book. Right? Yeah, maybe I wouldn't say villains, but but heavies certainly. Um, these are the hedgehogs. Uh, who try to straighten out the rough timber of humanity. You mentioned Berlin, uh, as I Berlin, a couple of times. Can you talk a little bit about Berlin's concept, which ultimately, of course, he has borrowed, of the foxes and the hedgehog? And then secondarily, are all of these leaders, Philip II, Xerxes, etc., cetera, uh, do they have a bad temperament or are they bad historians? Hmm. Um. Well, let me say a word about the foxes and the hedgehogs. That's where this book actually got started. Because when the Kennan book came out, uh, people were saying, uh, what's the next book going to be? And I was saying, it's not going to be a next book. I'm just going to stop while I'm ahead. And then they said, you can't do that. Uh, and I said, well, uh, uh, OK. So I, I, I had to come up with a cover story. So I would say, just for you, uh, and I'd point to Ted, just for you, Ted. I would write a book on foxes and hedgehogs, and I meant it just as a cover story, just to dodge the issue. But then I got interested in the critters themselves, uh, and then I got interested in the dichotomy and where it came from, and I got interested in the history of it with Isaiah Berlin. Its origins at a party in Oxford just as a scheme for classifying great writers, uh, its evolution into what became uh, a pretty seminal idea in uh, modern uh, civilization. The fox knows many things. The hedgehog knows uh, one big thing. And um, I got interested in uh, literally some social science research that the psychologist Phil Tetlock had done back in the uh, 1980s, a classic study on prediction and why people get uh, predictions, uh, what makes for accuracy in Tetlock studied something like uh, 285 public intellectuals, tracked their predictions over uh, something like a 15-year period. Uh, where were they right? Where were they wrong? Uh, ran all kinds of variables to try to test what 
made for accuracy and what uh, did not. Found no correlation that made any sense except one. And this was when he asked his public intellectuals to self-identify themselves, uh, were they, did they consider themselves to be foxes, many things, or hedgehogs, many, one big thing. And suddenly, the correlation was completely clear. The foxes were much more accurate predictors than the hedgehogs. The hedgehogs had a predictive track record that approximated a presumably theoretical chimpanzee throwing darts. Uh, and uh, this shook up everybody, including Tetlock. It was an unexpected uh, finding uh, from the study. Uh, but it's one that has, uh, uh, it was one that was very seriously done. And it raised a further issue that has preoccupied Professor Tetlock um, as well, which is this. Hedgehogs he found tend to rise faster in organizations than foxes do. Uh, and this puzzled him, given the abysmal predictive track <laughs> record of those hedgehogs. And, but he pointed out that uh, the hedgehog, because he knows one big thing, is good at sound bites and PowerPoint and uh, being interviewed on television or at Heritage Foundation or anywhere else. <laughs> Surely not. Right. <laughs> and the hedgehog, uh, knowing many things, uh, is not very good at this because the hedgehog is, uh, the fox is constantly trying to qualify things on the one hand this and the other hand that and so on and so forth. And so it is the foxes, despite their uh, inaccuracy, who tend to rise higher. Hedge, uh, sorry, the hedgehogs who tend to rise uh, higher. So this is a great paradox for leadership. If this is true, if this is actually borne out, uh, then uh, the implications are pretty profound. And I thought it would be fun to take that idea and just go back through time, which I think nobody has really done and look at some major foxes and some major hedgehogs and just uh, compare their track records. And uh, sure enough, Tetlock is borne out uh, pretty clearly. My major hedgehogs um, were Xerxes invading Greece in 480 BC with disastrous uh, results. Uh, Pericles going to Sicily with the Athenians uh, somewhat later in that century. Um, <laughs> Certainly, Philip II in this uh, English Channel with the uh, Spanish Armada. Certainly, Napoleon in his later career uh, 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 invading Russia. Uh, certainly, uh, Hitler invading Russia, but also in, in World War II, but also the Japanese. Uh, very lingered thinking, losing track of the connection between uh, uh, aspirations and capabilities regarding their own aspirations as simply uh, infinite, focusing only on one big idea and not looking at what else was going on around them. And then at a critical moment in the writing of this book, I went to see the Lincoln movie, Steven Spielberg's movie, 2012. You may remember the great scene in which Daniel Day-Lewis is playing Thaddeus Stevens and is explaining to Stevens why Lincoln is uh, making all these deals, sleazy deals, bribery, arm twisting, lying, deception, just about everything short of murder, to get the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery through the House of Representatives. Stephen says, why, Mr. President, in such a worthy cause would you use such methods? And Lincoln uh, makes the whole argument in about two minutes of dialogue in the movie. Fake dialogue, I think, is invented. But what he says essentially is that in his days as a surveyor, the compass was a very useful instrument because that's how he knew where true north was. But if the only thing he had done was to look at the compass, he would have wound up in a swamp or would have fallen off a cliff or would have been stranded somewhere in a desert. So what Lincoln was talking about was the capacity to be both fox and hedgehog at the same time, to have a sense of direction, a, a noble cause out there, but to be situationally aware of what was going on around him uh, at the same time. And I came to the conclusion that at the top, this is a very rare quality. I think Octavian Augustus had it, Whittington had it, Elizabeth had it, Sophie Burr had it, for sure. Doesn't happen very often. 
then if that's true, why do all my students have it? <laughs> because uh, look what they do when they walk out of the classroom. The first thing they do is to whip out their iPhone, unless it has been biologically attached to the hand in the first place, which I sometimes <laughs> suspect. They whip out their iPhone and they consult the iPhone and they're texting as they go down the hall. And they know where they're going. They don't run into, any, they don't run into other students or professors or whatnot. They maintain situational awareness while they know where they're going for lunch, next class, whatever it is. Now, how do they lose that capacity as they rise <laughs> in responsibility? That's what I'm concerned about. Something happens to us in the process of that rise. And I'm uh, still somewhat at a loss to know just what this is, but I thought it was useful to try to investigate some case studies where I think that happened for one reason or another. Does life get harder, or is it educated out of you? <clears throat> I think it may be both, Ted. Uh, life surely gets harder uh, in the sense that uh, you, but, but you know, even life can be hard even if you don't have responsibilities, you know, so I'm not sure it's necessarily harder. But I, I think uh, education may well have something to do with it because I think education is, um, takes place in certain categories. You major in something, you get graduated as a specialist in something. The educational world, the academic world, is not very receptive to generalists and has not been for a long time, although it used to be. Uh, so I think that may have something uh, to do with it. The very professionalization of our uh, society uh, is a reflection of that kind of um, parochialism, uh, it seems to me. Sure, to some extent, the sophistication of our world requires uh, specialization. But I think the ability <coughs> to achieve that and at the same time hang on to the situational awareness that causes you to see where you're going um, is absolutely critical and sadly lacking. And one of the best places you can find this discussed is in Clausewitz's great book on war. <clears throat> because Clausewitz talks about the great value of planning uh, before you go to war. Um, and uh, training and all of this. But he says that when the war comes, the first thing you have to do is throw the plan out the window. But he says you will fight the war more efficiently for having done the planning, for having uh, gone through the exercise at the same time. <coughs> but you have to maintain the situational awareness. You have to look at what's happening around you uh, as you are uh, going to the war. You cannot be like Tolstoy's great character, Pierre, wandering around, blundering around on the battlefield at Borodino. And I got very preoccupied in writing that chapter at how much Clausewitz is like Tolstoy, because you can read War and Peace as making exactly the same uh, argument. Uh, deep contempt for formal theory, uh, great respect <clears throat> for those like Kutusov who have uh, operational uh, experience know what really is going on. Uh, and uh, so I actually paired the two of them, the chapters on Clausewitz uh, and Tolstoy together. And I found the connection so uh, remarkable and so innocent, really, uh, so uh, uh, impressive. But I say in the book, I think it's almost as if Clausewitz and Tolstoy, if you put them together, are finishing each other's sentences. Now, how can that be? Well, uh, both were combat officers. Clausewitz in the actual war of 1812, Tolstoy in the Crimean War and the wars in the Caucasus. <coughs> Excuse me, both knew what they were talking about and both make that link between the real world, uh, which is that world that Lincoln was talking about where you have to maintain situational uh, awareness. And at the same time, the need to maintain your uh, sense of direction. What is it all about? What is the mission? What is the objective? sort of goes back to the, the reason why the Grand Strategy Seminar was started in the first place, which was the sense among the faculty that the seminar was really intended for graduate students uh, when it started, the sense that graduate students were becoming or were excessively specialized uh, in their doctoral studies and were losing any sort of broad ability either to apply to their own studies or to apply to their teaching uh, in, in later years. Uh, I, I would like to sort of go on to culture. Which was very sad because uh, you know we felt like very quickly we were losing the grad students. The undergrads were completely happy with what we were doing, and it has remained ever since primarily an undergrad. 
as I recall, the grad student dominance lasted for the first year, and then, then they were more or less out of there, not completely, but more or less. Uh, one of the most striking passages in the book is Bernard DeVoto's and Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s conversation in 1940. Um, DeVoto writes, they, they, these, these two scholars are, have been driving across the United States, um, and they've, they've reached the American Southwest. And DeVoto writes that the neat houses in the United States, of which he's now seen several thousand miles of, are, quote, a windbreak against the erosion of the times. Uh, which is really a wonderful phrase if you think about what's going on in the world in 1940 as being akin in great affairs to what the Dust Bowls of the 1930s were to the United States. So um, the erosion of the times. Uh, to what extent does strategy require or presuppose uh, a sort of a, a, a rooted national culture that you're working from? Or, or is that that is that kind of culture is something that you can or you should build if you want to be practicing grand strategy. Well, this passage from uh, Devoto, which uh, he actually published in Harper's, he was uh, editor of the Easy Chair in Harper's uh, at that point. This is all something I stole from Bob Kaplan because Bob deals with it in his book Earning the Rockies, which I recommend to you. So I just took it and ran a little further uh, with it. But I think it is absolutely critical, Ted, to what you're talking about. I don't think grand strategy can in any way be separated from national culture and from the robustness and self-confidence of uh, national culture. And one of the things that really impressed me in doing this book uh, was going back as far as the founding fathers and finding a vision among them of the need for the United States to be a continental republic from ocean to ocean. Uh, so this notion is not something that comes with Manifest Destiny in 1848, but it's there as early as uh, the Federalist Papers, it's there as early as Tom Paine uh, as well. There was the sense that uh, we had the great opportunity to uh, uh, build this great republic, base it on this uh, magnificent uh, continent and the responsibility to hold it together, hence the urgent responsibility of what Lincoln uh, took extremely seriously in the Civil War when he said uh, the United States was the last best hope of mankind. That was the context, that the country hold together and then be in a position when necessary to come to the rescue of the old world when it needed this as well. And that's an idea that is floating along uh, 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 very gently under the surface but people are talking about it and thinking about it. And of course, it all uh, comes true three times in the 20th uh, century. And of course, if that continental republic had not held together, what we did three times in the 20th century would not have been possible. I think about how we did it. Think about how we held it together. We annihilated uh, the Native Americans. We stole uh, uh, half of Mexico from the Mexicans. We did all kinds of things that are considered now uh, in the academy to have been brutal acts of oppression, and in many ways uh, they certainly were. But without having done them, we would not have been able to do what we did uh, magnificently in Europe in the, in the 20th century. And I think paradoxically this quote from uh, Devoto, thanks to Bob Kaplan, uh, is an almost lyrical way of saying this because uh, uh, Devoto is on the verge of writing his great book, 1846. He's driving across the country. He's got a young research assistant. This is Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. It's 1940. Uh, they are uh, driving across. They come to uh, uh, the Rockies just before Trinidad, uh, Colorado. They pull off the road uh, and turn on the radio. And uh, a couple of, uh, using their term, Mexicans, approach and ask if they could listen too. And that's very poignant because if you think about it, this territory that they are looking at, they're all seeing, was once owned by Mexicans. <laughs> in this case, they're simply uh, all together in this car, smoking cigarettes, listening to one of FDR's fireside chats, which is about the great continental republic and what it can be capable of. And then at the end of this passage, 
uh, there's this wonderful evocative line, which always reduces my wife to tears when she reads it. Uh, Devoto says, uh, at that point, we waved, said goodbye, and drove on to Trinidad. Uh, and that's where the chapter ends. This is one of my rare efforts to try to be poignant and literary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and obviously it struck a chord uh, with you. I think it makes an important point, though, because the general drift of the story and the general drift of what Devoto and Sosner saw is they drove across the country in 1940. It was a reviving country, a country deeply hurt by the Depression, a country that had lost its self-confidence, but was regaining it in fundamental ways. And this was uh, uh, apparent in the appearance of the houses uh, that they passed, particularly in the appearance of the schools that they, that they passed. What they saw was profoundly optimistic in a profoundly pessimistic time because France is just, this is May 1940, France is just about to fall. So the juxtaposition of these things, I think, is, is uh, quite wonderful. And I think it makes the larger point, the condition of the country, the morale of the country, what's going on out there in middle America, is part of grand strategy. And when you lose that self-confidence for whatever reason, you lose uh, the ability to be a continental republic, as we had historically uh, been. You lose the ability to mobilize the resources, which are both physical and moral, that this country can bring uh, to bear. And it does seem to me that we have gone through, but hardly noticed until uh, 2016, uh, such a moment of loss of self-confidence in the middle part of the country. And the great loss was simply the loss of the confidence that people had that their kids were going to do better than they had done, something that Americans had always had in the past, confidence in that future, but had lost. And I think this is uh, uh, accounts for so many things that are going on. Hysteria about immigration, uh, concerns about uh, trade, uh, all of these uh, issues uh, that are very much with us today. This is why, Ted, I would regard uh, J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy as a profound work of grand strategy mm -hmm. in the sense that it explores a national culture. It documents uh, this loss of self-confidence almost with the same, uh, yeah. with more than the same eloquence yeah. that Devoto did uh, back in this period. And I think we as students of strategy need to be open to these kinds of concerns. We need to be open to what is what concerns people, what is affecting their daily lives. And if we have to resort to a few literary devices to express this, I think that's, that's all to the good. Uh, we should use whatever help we can, can get. Dan spoke here about six months or so ago, so I'm not sure we viewed it as work with grand strategy, but we certainly picked out a, a good author and a good book. It's got the most fearsome grandmother in all of recent <laughs> modern. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to ask just two more questions, and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, first, uh, you quote uh, Professor Donald Kagan in emphasizing that the Greeks, the Athenians, uh, knew some things that we have forgotten. Uh, presumably, that's true of other past greats as well. Uh, what do you think the founders of the American Republic knew that we have forgotten? I think it's a very important point in teaching history to um, uh, remind students of that. And one of the other great uh, um, expressors of this idea was the late Stephen Jay Gould in his work on paleontology. Uh, Steve always had the greatest respect for people, uh, scientists, uh, three or four centuries earlier, who had gotten things completely wrong in terms of what the science was. But he says the way their minds worked to these conclusions was in itself uh, impressive and should be uh, commemorated. Uh, and that point always resonated with me. It's just that uh, who are we to say that we are smarter than they were back then, whenever they were uh, and whenever then uh, actually was. So that's the context uh, of this, and I was very happy in reading uh, Don Kagan's Thucydides biography to see him saying uh, exactly the same thing. And I think this is something that uh, we have a powerful obligation to, uh, to teach our students uh, as well. I talk at the end of the book about respect for the past. 
respect for the past doesn't mean that you necessarily have to agree with everything that was done in the past. But there is an obligation, it seems to me, to try to figure out why people did things uh, uh, in the past. What was on their minds? What was moving them? What did they think their children were going to face? All of those things. And be aware uh, of that. And I think it's a key to sound historical uh, responsibility uh, uh, as well. So uh, this too fits within my rather uh, capacious, increasingly capacious <laughs> as we go along, uh, definition of uh, a friend strategy, uh, for sure. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, one final question. Yep. Um, when, when the grant strategy program at Yale first got going, at least its initial years, I recall I would say to people, oh, we're starting to work on grand strategy. And inevitably, they would mishear you and, and hear it as grant strategy. Yes. <laughs> In other words, fundraising. Right. Um, and and that, that, that misunderstanding, purposeful or not, lasted, I think, for three or four years until we really got established on, on campus. Uh, but maybe we should return to grant strategy. Uh, you, you dedicate the book uh, to Nicholas Brady and Charles Johnson and Sam Chauncey. Uh, can you say a, a little something in, in closing this part of our conversation about the role of philanthropy sure. in preserving what we might call a fox-like diversity uh, in higher education? Of course. Um, we, um, in starting, first of all, we started the program as a great experiment, we being Charlie Hill, Paul Kennedy, and I. And we had no idea that it would take off or work, but after 9-11, it certainly did. So uh, we knew we had a growing thing. But we were still preoccupied with uh, short-term fundraising from foundations, and we had the good luck to be supported by several. Uh, but it was at the same time a distraction constantly to have to worry about this. And we kept going to Rick Levin, the then president of Yale, saying, Rick, you have to get us um, an endowment uh, somehow. And Rick would just kind of smile uh, because his style was just to let things run for a while, see how they operated, and then if he was satisfied that they were working, then he would make a phone call here and there. And that is uh, pretty much what he did. Sam Chauncey's role, uh, Sam Chauncey, the former uh, uh, secretary of the university all the way back in the Kim and Brewster period, was to serve as the intermediary uh, between us and potential donors, in this case, Nick and Charlie. And so one day, there was just a phone call from Rick Levin saying, I have your endowment for you. Uh, and uh, it was uh, quite amazing uh, thing. And um, so on first meeting, uh, and not first meeting, but I mean, after learning about this and talking to Nick Brady, uh, I said something like, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brady, for the money. What do you want us to do with it? And Nick said, teach common sense. That's all he said. And I remembered very well what General Marshall had said to George Kennan when Kennan set up the policy planning staff. And uh, Marshall, in response to Kennan's request for instructions, simply said, avoid trivia, two words. Nick came very close to that, uh, using three words. But something like that uh, has been our guiding light uh, ever since. We've never had any more clear sense of direction from these donors than that. That's about it. They have trusted us to uh, do this right. They watch very carefully, particularly Nick watches us very carefully, and Charlie Hill and I have phone conversations with Nick. Nick is one of the rare people I know who really uh, actually still uses a telephone. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise it's going to be robocalls, but uh, uh, Nick is the only substantive phone conversations that I tend to have. And so He's calling out to me when I ask a question about this or that. Never to try to tell us what to do. And we've been extraordinarily lucky to have that uh, trust uh, from these uh, major donors. Uh, an example of how Nick works came up about five years ago when I had a phone call from Nick. And he said, you know, John, he said, the three of you, meaning uh, Charlie and Paul and me, are not getting any younger. He said, he said, you guys could croak at any time. <laughs> <laughs> Nick is now 87, I think, or something like that. And he did say, this was one recommendation that we had, you better start thinking about a successor. And so with that injunction, uh, we did. We uh, went through quite an orderly long-term 
succession uh, process, wound up with uh, Betsy Bradley, uh, who we knew was going to go elsewhere fairly quickly, and she went on to become president of Vassar. But the new director of the Grand Strategy Program is Professor Beverly Gage, and she is uh, writing the definitive biography of uh, J. Edgar Hoover. She's written on the Wall Street bombing of 1920. And she is taking the course in somewhat different directions from where we left it. Uh, we haven't totally left it because we still come in periodically. But Bev has a mandate uh, to do certain things. One of them came from Nick Brady. Deal with the inequality issue. Nick was one of the very first people I knew five, six, seven years ago uh, to say inequality is going to be a big issue, economic inequality. But we really didn't know, having very little training in economics, what we were supposed to do with this. And so uh, we kind of uh, floundered around with that. But uh, Bev has made that uh, a, a concern of the course. Uh, we now have a, 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 a unit on the grand strategy of social protest, uh, which we did not have uh, before. And this is particularly with the civil rights movement. Uh, we have even done a case study on uh, freedom to marry uh, in the gay marriage movement as a uh, protest movement that uh, achieved remarkable success in a very brief period of time. How did that happen? All of these are uh, new departures for what has been traditionally thought of as a, as a fairly traditional uh, program. Uh, two female directors uh, in a row running the program very successfully always had the same gender balance. It's always been very close to 50-50 uh, through the whole history of the, of the class. But I think the image of the program has changed somewhat on campus. Uh, and I think it began to change for the better as soon as I got out of it. Uh, <laughs> running it you know? And uh, that was Nick Brady's doing. You know, he saw that uh, need for that to happen uh, as well. So all I can say is that we've been extraordinarily lucky in uh, the uh, uh, donors. And I recommend that strategy to you in selecting donors. Try to be extraordinarily lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's nothing better than being lucky or perhaps in strategy being a genius. Um, it, it solves a great many otherwise very intractable difficulties. Uh, I think it's time for some questions from the audience. Uh, I see uh, Andrew has, has got a microphone. Uh, when the microphone comes around, uh, if you could uh, state your name. Uh, we are broadcasting on the web. And uh, if you have an affiliation, state it. If otherwise, don't worry about it. And as always, my admonition, please phrase your question in the form of a question. So the gentleman who is hiding right behind the pillar here. Gordon Johnson, private sector. I had occasion to hear Dean Acheson talk about Truman and his, the remark of things that made him great. But he ended up saying, but above all, he was lucky. What role does luck play in strategies, were, were these grand strategies working out or not working out? Well, I'm not sure that I would agree that Truman was lucky. Uh, I think what Atchison probably means by luck uh, is that uh, Truman had the luck to have M. Dean Atchison <laughs> available. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's uh, something very important there about Truman's uh, style of operation, which I don't think was just luck. Truman knew how to delegate authority. Uh, he knew that he was a man of limited skills. Uh, he did have a great sense of responsibility. And he knew how to work comfortably with people who were smarter than he was. And so that could be George Marshall as Secretary of State, and then later, Atchison. Truman's choices were not always uh, successful. Uh, but he did make some of the very best uh, appointments uh, in, in uh, the field. I was very curious with that analogy in mind. Who are some other people who understood the value of, of um, delegation? Well, one was Octavian, uh, who was no success on battlefields. And so he hired his friend of Grippa, lifelong friend of Grippa, to fight his battles uh, for him and build his buildings and let him work very comfortably. Uh, he at some point felt the need for a national epic. And this is why we have the Aeneid. Uh, it's a commissioned work that Octavian uh, actually commissioned. So he was not one of these micromanagers. Uh, he understood and was able to work with people uh, in this regard. Uh, 
Uh, there were elements of this uh, for sure in Lincoln, um, particularly once he found a, a workable general, his own Agrippa uh, Grant, uh, as his Ron Chernow biography, waiting for the musical. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, probably elements of this, chaotic though his administrative methods seem to be with uh, FDR uh, himself. So I hold that out, that ability to delegate authority uh, as a, a pretty important element of grand strategy. And I think it circles back around to the interesting question of how presidents use their time these days. Uh, to the ones that uh, feel obliged to be on top of everything, therefore don't have time to think uh, in depth about anything. And then on the other hand, those who feel that they can leave some things uh, to others and retain uh, the, the time to think. Or maybe some who just come in having uh, very strong ideas and uh, seek to, I'm not gonna name any names uh, in any of this, but I am saying the business of administration, the business of micro versus macro management, the ability to delegate authority, does seem to me to be connected with effectiveness in uh, grand strategy and uh, uh, not to work very well when somebody does not have the ability to delegate. A former colleague of mine down here in the front row. Well, thank you, Ted. Uh, Ray Walser, formerly of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, try to interject a little bit more contemporaneous issue into this and maybe turning to you as both eminent historian and secondly, the man who knows the mind of George F. Kennan. Uh, we are at this particular point uh, at a, it seems like an inflection point in the world about to leave one nuclear agreement about to quote unquote try to enter into a new one with another uh, rival uh, challenge there. Do you have any sort of comments of, of what would be the strategic approach to these two issues? Uh, the strategic approach meaning? Um, where, where, we, where, we, <laughs> where should we be headed? Uh, well, um, I don't have. Uh, and uh, this is partly for reasons of competence. I'm not sure that I know enough about uh, this very immediate issue to be able to make an intelligent uh, judgment about it. I really quite often get asked the question, which I, where I thought you were going to go, what would George Kennan Well, that was part of it. That was the second. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's something else that I have very carefully tried to stay away from. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I think I knew George Kennan pretty well. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think I should, I also knew enough to know that I should not try to speak for him uh, beyond where he is now. He was unpredictable enough in life, uh, surprising enough in life, and uh, I think, again, out of respect for the dead, it's better simply to uh, study these people, uh, treat them seriously, take them on their own terms but not try to impose our problems uh, back on, on them. I don't think that helps us. I think it helps the other way. If we take seriously the problems that they had, we evolve from that certain principles, broader principles for dealing with leadership issues, and then seek to apply those to the very different situations that we face uh, today. And that's what I prefer to do. Maybe it's a cop-out, but I prefer to. <laughs> it does remind me a little bit of people who will uh, predict or prognosticate what my favorite statesman, Winston Churchill, would yeah. do or say about a particular issue today. And, you know, we all indulge in this. I have indulged it a little bit myself. But sort of at the back of your mind, there's always the thought, if you're so smart, why aren't you Churchill? Yeah. Um, you know, it just, it just doesn't work, unfortunately. Yeah. The gentleman sitting right in the center here. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Carl Golovin, domain reference and idea lives on dot net. And thank you for being here. And I bought a copy of your book when I first arrived. And I've begun looking through it. And one thing that I did notice in the index, there's only one page, page 60, referring to John Kennedy. And uh, it quotes from a speech he gave oh, yeah. on November 22nd, 1963, without referencing that that was the day he was assassinated. And You're I meant to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> I left that to you. <laughs> I and, and I leave to you, I, you, um, you know what I'm in doing. terms of strategy, he gave a speech uh, June 10th of 1963 here at American University in which he called for a strategy for peace among the nations, even that we um, view our tensions with the Soviet Union through their eyes and their history of losing yes. 20, 
20 million people in World War II. Yeah. And um, so what is your, uh, do you think a strategy for peace is not part of grand no, strategy? Yes. And, and in, in just a last thought, in, uh, in quoting from Augustine, I don't see any quotes referencing the, the words of Christ admonishing us to love one another and do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Is there any room for that in grand strategy? Uh, certainly, sir, but I do think you're sort of rewriting my book for me uh, <laughs> in this regard. Uh, the context of the Kennedy quote was uh, simply the similarity in thinking about the way in which we define vital interests with regard to Vietnam, which the Athenians de defined vital interests in, uh, in going to Sicily. Uh, the rhetoric of the domino theory uh, uh, seems to have been equally important in both, and I thought there was a great sense of both tragedy and irony that JFK's last public speech was not one that was calling for understanding, as was the case with the American University speech, but was one that was seeing, uh, uh, was a, a classic Cold War domino theory speech. And uh, that's sad, he could not have known it was his last speech, of course, but history is full of these kinds of um, ironies, and that's what I was trying to express uh, in that regard. A uh, gentleman uh, seated right here, again, behind the pillar. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Zhou Zixin from Shanghai Institute for International Studies and also Vetting Fellow in CSIS. I just have um, two very old uh, questions. Uh, and uh, I think the strategy is always grand, no small strategy. And the first question is about how can we find the differences between the offensive strategy and also defensive strategy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, the offensive strategies are conducted in the name of defense sense. Uh, second question is about how can we find the links between the consistent strategy and also the uh, inconsistent policies. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, it's very difficult to find the logic. Okay, thank you. Well, the issue of uh, what is offensive and what is defensive um, in grand strategy, I actually think it's a false distinction. And I go back and actually discuss this in the book with regard to the Athenian long walls, which they built in the wake of the Persian invasion. Uh, in effect, uh, walling off their city from the countryside, acknowledging <coughs> the Spartans' land power superiority but in fact turning Athens and Piraeus into islands which would be uh, uh, relevant or would be reliant uh, on naval strength uh, uh, totally. What was interesting about the decision is that the Athenians saw the building of the long walls as a defensive act, but the Spartans saw the building of the long walls as a provocative act, an act of provocation. And Thucydides gives us uh, very graphically the debates uh, at Sparta, which reflected both points of view. And I think that's a fascinating case because it's so clear. We're talking about a, an object, a wall around a city that uh, was simultaneously uh, defensive to the side that built it, but offensive to the side that saw it being built. And I think that's a, a, a tendency that has persisted through, throughout um, history. Uh, and um, I think we have to be very sensitive to this because uh, uh, it's very important in grand strategy to try to see how both sides uh, see things. So just take the One Belt, One Road initiative of Xi Jinping uh, today. Uh, the Chinese uh, may see this as uh, an, an, an enterprising but at the same time defensive uh, initiative. Uh, we tend to see it in the other way as some kind of an offensive uh, provocation. Maybe those categories don't even work for something as complicated as what is being talked about uh, here. But the lesson it does seem to me should be just try to see it from the other side's uh, point of, of view. Uh, and I think that's always the strategist's obligation. I'm, I'm reminded in the 1920s of the disarmament conferences, which mm -hmm. tended to founder on efforts to divine whether or not a particular weapon was offensive or defensive. It turned out that no agreement was ever possible. Uh, my colleague, Terry Miller, uh, right down there in the corner, and then perhaps we'll go to the eminent classicist seated right behind him. 
Thank you, Professor. Early in the, uh, earlier in the discussion, you were talking about the value of uh, thinking like foxes mm -hmm. uh, rather than hedgehogs, and yet then you described the evolution of the uh, program uh, that's now going to focus on inequality, uh, gay rights or marriage equality, social justice issues, and I wonder, those seem to me to be deep into hedgehog territory, uh, at least in the way they're commonly perceived um, in America today. And I wonder if you could comment on, on whether my understanding of this evolution is correct or not. Well, I'm, I'm not quite sure um, why they would be regarded uh, in that way. If you can be a little more explicit, I could try to answer that. Um, I, it does not automatically seem to me that they are automatically hedgehog uh, issues. Well, they're certainly they're certainly highly politicized issues oh, these sure. days. But they're um, most, identified with one political party more than another. Most issues are, and um, <laughs> and uh, they tend to uh, mm -hmm. uh, create a political dynamic that is single issue oriented mm -hmm. rather than. Mm -hmm. um, more uh, widely dispersed in terms of thinking? Well, that would be one of the things that we would try to raise as a question uh, with regard to uh, the teaching of those cases. Uh, in uh, trying to shift the ground on particularly uh, social issues um, is the most effective grand strategy to focus on that one issue and uh, uh, put your uh, emphasis behind that and not to look at it in the larger context? Or is it more important to work more broadly uh, within, the, within the system? That's a question that I hope we will try to deal with. I don't know what the answer uh, will be. It's not one that I'm teaching. But I think it would be a worthy issue to certainly raise with regard to um, both of those, those questions, for sure. Uh, right behind. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, Hello, I'm Josiah Osgood. I teach uh, Roman history at Georgetown, and I was delighted to see just how much ancient history was in was in the book. And I'm wondering, uh, as a historian of the 20th century, um, what was it about these ancient figures that appealed to you in particular, or more generally, why did you choose the figures you did choose to focus on in the book? Um, well, I'm certainly uh, I certainly have questionable credentials as an ancient historian. Uh, that's for sure. I'm about as far away from that as uh, possible. I would say it was a traumatic childhood experience that led to this. Uh, and the traumatic childhood experience was uh, shortly after uh, graduate school. Uh, not quite childhood, but close to it. Still very young. Um, having given a talk at Newport at the Naval War College uh, in 1974, Finding an admiral sitting in the front row who actually introduced me. This was Admiral, the late Admiral Stansfield Turner. Uh, and I was talking about my new book, uh, and that was all I was told to talk about. And I did that. And the admiral got up afterwards and said to the few hundred or so students who were there, Professor Gaddis was right on the following issues, and he was wrong on the following issues. But he was right on enough issues that he will be teaching grand strategy at the Naval War College next year. <laughs> Nobody had told Professor Gaddis any of this. <laughs> but Professor, Professor Gaddis was not used to dealing with admirals. And uh, he did not know how to say no to an admiral. And so I said yes uh, and was thrown into uh, teaching Thucydides, a text I had never read. Uh, to a group of uh, just returned uh, military officers, all of whom were older than I was, all of whom had Vietnam service, none of whom wanted to talk about it, all of whom were wondering who this twerp was that the uh, uh, Navy, in its wisdom, had put in charge of their seminar. The only reassuring thing for them in all of this, but not reassuring for me, was that my teaching partner was a three-tour-of-duty, cigar-chomping Marine colonel. The whole thing was one of the most wonderful experiences that I have ever had. And what Turner was doing in assigning Thucydides was approaching Vietnam indirectly. He knew that it was too controversial, it was too soon to talk directly about Vietnam. And besides, there were no books that we could read on that. Uh, he was himself a classicist, he'd been a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and uh, he uh, knew how the book comes out. The Athenians go to Sicily with disastrous results. 
uh, and um, so he just assigned the book, but with no instructions on what parts of it to read. Read all of it, he said. And so uh, we all did, and I was staying one day ahead of the uh, students. Uh, and uh, it was a remarkable uh, experience. But when we got to the Sicilian expedition, and the disastrous account of the Athenian defeat in uh, Sicily, suddenly the floodgates opened in this seminar, and these guys wanted to talk about nothing else. And it just, it's what cracked the code. It's what broke the psychological barrier and just allowed all of this to come out. And it was deeply moving to see this happening. Uh, somewhat fearsome in the sense that I didn't feel I was fully in control of this uh, the seminar. But nonetheless, uh, it was a profound lesson about how the classics can be used by indirection uh, to get to something that's very important. And um, I talk about this in the book. I never quite figured out how that mechanism works. How do the classics play this role? Um, until many, many years later, I was teaching a freshman seminar uh, at Yale. Uh, and uh, I decided to require the freshmen to read War and Peace, every line of it, all 1,200 pages, which made the reading load twice what a normal Yale seminar was. But they were all freshmen, and they didn't know any better. <laughs> so they did it. You know. And of course, they got hooked on it uh, immediately and kept bringing it up, even on days when I had not assigned it. And one day, I was, I was fascinated by this, and one day I just said, well, what relevance do you see uh, in your life to Natasha and Prince Andre uh, and uh, Pierre, particularly their favorite character was Pierre. And uh, there was one of these moments of silence around the table, and then uh, something like three students said the same thing. They make us feel less lonely knowing that there is somebody else out there who has gone through some of the same uncertainty, some of the same uh, doubt, self-doubt, all of this, that we have. Somebody else has written uh, about this, uh, knowing from this that there are probably a lot of others in history who have gone through this. It's comforting. It makes us feel less lonely. And I thought back to my officers at Newport. They would never have admitted that. They would never have said it in that way. But I think that is what opened the floodgates, the realization they were not alone in having suffered a vast military defeat like that. Others had had that experience in the past, too. And by studying these uh, experiences in the past, sometimes the fact that they are so far distant in the past seems to make them actually more relevant. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I think it sometimes does. Uh, had a powerful effect uh, on them. And to this day, Thucydides is still taught uh, in the Naval War College. Uh, there are no Vietnam vets who still go there, but certainly it uh, was a powerful experience at the time and certainly shaped uh, my own concern and interest in, in grand strategy. I would never have gotten interested in uh, that subject, having been trained just as a conventional American diplomatic historian, had I not had that, that teaching experience. The irony, if I recall correctly, is that the Naval War College got the idea of teaching grand strategy from Yale University, <coughs> which then abandoned the subject <coughs> only to have it reintroduced to Yale by Professor Gaddis from the Naval War College. Well, this was always what Stan Turner said. I asked him a little later when I got to know him better, and I figured out that his first name was really Stan and not Admiral. <laughs> I said, Stan, where did you get this idea? And he, he said, oh, we got it from you guys back when you used to teach this sort of thing. But that's shrouded in myth and legend, so I haven't really pinned down exactly what was being taught back, uh, back then. It's, I don't know. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. The gentleman seated right at the front here. Thank you. I'm uh, Will Embry. Uh, I would say I'm one of a number of generations of National War College students who studied uh, containment thanks to your book. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, it, it appears to me that Woodrow Wilson and John Dulles both were profoundly religious and use their religious uh, uh, beliefs as the lodestone for their foreign policy. I was wondering what you thought of that as uh, 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 making them good or bad uh, grand strategists. Well, um, they weren't the only inf influential people in American history who were deeply religious. 
But deep religiosity takes several different kinds of forms. Lincoln was deeply religious uh, in his own way. And uh, his views on religion changed uh, over the years as he himself uh, had painted. And we can track, I think, with somewhat greater precision uh, Lincoln's views than it is possible to track um, Wilson's, even with all the better documentation that we have on Wilson. It's often said that Wilson's uh, deep commitment to religion made him rigid, uh, made him hedgehog-like, caused him to uh, ignore surroundings, uh, may have given him the confidence to drive to a certain point, but uh, left him abandoned when he felt that, um, as he must have felt, that God had abandoned him uh, in, the, in the latter part of his, of his life. And I don't know whether that is true or not. You would have to ask the Wilson biographers. I suspect parts of it are true uh, also. John Foster Dulles is an extraordinarily complex uh, figure, uh, as was Wilson. Uh, and I don't think religion uh, in itself was a uh, dominant characteristic of his, uh, I think, six or four or five different things were at different times. Uh, and he's, he's fascinating. What I found uh, fascinating was actually to go take religion very seriously as a grand strategy topic, but carry it back again to the classics. Uh, so uh, having done the Romans, or having done Octavian Augustus, I then have uh, half of a chapter on St. Augustine, and uh, who is himself a fascinating character because of our access to him by way of the confessions. Um, uh, by way of what we can deduce of what he must have meant, although it's hard in City of God, but also in terms of the huge tradition that he left behind, uh, just war theory, but also uh, more broadly, the history of uh, Christianity. And particularly fascinating, uh, I pair uh, Augustine in that chapter with Machiavelli. I'm not sure that's been done before. Uh, the thousand years separated them. But they actually had interesting things to say to each other. Uh, a very different view of how God operates. God does not want to do everything, Machiavelli said, which would have been very different from what Augustine believed. But on the other hand, in the uh, acceptance of the notion of proportionality, which is implied in just war theory, that's something that Machiavelli could be quite comfortable uh, with. So I looked at it uh, from uh, those points of view. And then found myself uh, in the next chapter, which is on Elizabeth and Philip, in an almost a test case uh, of an Augustinian versus a Machiavellian, with Philip, dedicated Catholic, uh, being very much an Augustinian. Everything that happens is because of God's will. Uh, Elizabeth, much more Machiavellian, uh, perhaps because she had read it in the original, which she was capable of doing as a young woman. Uh, uh, and uh, saying, uh, no, God does not want to do everything. In fact, he leaves a few things to me, and I will do them. Uh, she says, that's her attitude. You see. And so it tracks very well to trace these two traditions, uh, both informed by religion, but in a different direction, uh, through uh, Elizabeth and Philip. But then it tracks even more interestingly to think about colonization in the New World because it is under uh, Philip that the Spanish Empire in the New World probably reaches its, its highest point. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a Catholic uh, empire in which uh, everything was the same, uniformity uh, from Buenos Aires all the way up to Mexico City, same kinds of buildings, same kind of institutions, same forms of administration, uh, very little willingness to delegate. Everything had to be referred back to Madrid, which took uh, years to get word back and forth and so on. You know, very little delegation of authority, very little diversity uh, as well. But the British colonies in North America are amazingly messy uh, in the sense that um, even though Elizabeth is no longer there, her model, the joint stock companies, was left in effect. And each of these entrepreneurs was given a certain piece of territory which they could develop. And each of the 13 colonies was developed in this way. They were uh, extraordinarily different. Uh, the historian John Eliot makes the point that uh, a gentleman uh, proceeding from uh, Mexico City to Lima would have been perfectly comfortable and would have found no change 
uh, in what you saw. But what about a gentleman proceeding from Boston to Charleston, South Carolina? Huge difference in culture and uh, administration. Everything would have been different. And so that diversity in the colonization of the North American uh, colonies together with the uniformity or set against the uniformity of colonization in the uh, Spanish colonies, I think is historically significant. Uh, and I think that this adaptability on the part of the British colonists uh, the willingness to experiment with different approaches, uh, the uh, uh, self-confidence to administer uh, those republics in mentality, if not in, in fact, uh, really uh, accounts for their uh, extraordinary success both politically and economically over the years. And where did the uh, great Spanish colonies go? And Bolivar himself comments on this difference between so it's fascinating to be able to track these trends through. And I'm not sure the experts in any of these fields would accept what I've done here. But I am saying that I think something of the history of the New World tracks back to the difference between Spanish and British uh, English methods of uh, administration, which tracks back to the religiosity of uh, 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 Augustine and the uh, measured, uh, cautious, tactical religiosity, not absence of religiosity on Machiavelli's part, and so on. So I do take religion seriously uh, in this book. I surprised myself with where this went. I had not planned it. But I think it has a great deal to do uh, with uh, determining how someone views the world and how someone uh, uh, makes grand strategic choices. And of course, if you go back and accord the people of that epoch the respect that they deserve, to them, this question of what happens to your soul was the grandest of all grand strategic questions, uh, for sure. Uh, and so uh, uh, it makes sense that this would have been uh, a, a major concern for them, and then a major issue of state. So, so long answer, but it, uh, it was a fascinating excursion into these uh, chapters. I'm surprised where it went. Well, I think, unfortunately, we should probably bring this to a close. I have the feeling we could probably continue this for quite a while longer. Uh, but uh, in deference to Professor Gaddis's schedule, uh, let's close now. Um, remind you about the books, uh, if you'd like to purchase one and have it signed. But above all, uh, please join me in thanking Professor Gaddis for a superb appearance today at the Heritage Foundation.